ready for a new episode of KP Talks Dollars and Cents. Learn financial literacy and get real-time updates on all things housing, finance, and real estate with your host, Kevin Perenio. As an owner and C-level executive for 20-plus years in finance, KP is here to serve you with all of his knowledge and experience. Whether you're a broker, realtor, or just interested in the economy, this is the podcast for you. So let's get started. Here's your host, Kevin Perenio. Hey, it's KP coming to you live from Corona, California. Well, it's Monday, not super late. Trying to get out of here. We had our senior management meeting. We always do that the first Monday of every month. And uh, generally pretty good. Coming off a decent March. I know all ships rise at the tide. So uh, for those that aren't aware what's going on, March was generally a pretty good month for uh, mortgage bankers uh, across the spectrum. And uh, locks are looking pretty good for April. So has spring sprung? The spring purchase season, is it here? Is it finally here? Well, I'll tell you that uh, rates don't go down in a straight line, as we all know, and um, the Fed is driving the bus, and uh, they're also driving uh, not just mortgage interest rates, they're driving the fight on inflation, and they're driving the value of the dollar, which is very interesting. I read a cool article this weekend, it said, the Fed is always an expense to the Treasury when you net out cash flows. So if you think about the cash flows, uh, and uh, all this craziness that went on with the banks and uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities having to be marked to market. And um, our uh, friend of the show, Chris Whalen, who's been on CNBC quite a bit lately, too, um, loving his commentary uh, there on the National Network. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, what, if, what are the unintended consequences of quantitative easing and all these mortgage-backed securities and treasuries on all these banks' balance sheets and non-banks, for that matter. Um, you know, you mark them to market, if you're forced to sell, you know, they're not worth as much. I know we've talked about that a lot. And, um, you know, is this going to weaken the dollar? Are all these actions, the quantitative tightening, uh, this fight on inflation that we've been uh, battling, which hasn't gone down yet, um, are all these things going to attack our dollar and the strength of our economy? You know, there's a lot of headlines right now about China and Russia and India and Brazil aligning themselves together. They call that the BRIC countries, B-R-I-C. Um, you know, are they getting together to attack the U.S. dollar denomination of the world? I mean, some of that's a little bit of hubbub, but, you know, there are some alliances that could be made right now uh, that could hurt us in the long run. You know, a lot of the Western nations, you know, us and the European Union um, and even Japan, you know, we all stay pretty much aligned economically and militarily. Um, obviously, look what's going on in Ukraine and the Russian invasion there. But, um, you know, there are some shots being taken um, at those alliances. You know, how strong is the Canadian and U.S. and Mexican, uh, you know, alliance these days? Will it be tested with all the things that are going on if the U.S. economy goes into a recession and if the strength of the dollar uh, comes down? Now, generally, um, if the dollar value comes down, that's actually good for other countries because then their currencies have more strength against our goods and services and our uh, currency, the dollar. And so will that happen? Will that be something that, uh, you know, uh, you know will, will hurt our economy long term? We're going to find out. It did not help that yesterday on a Sunday, I'm sitting there watching the headline come across that OPEC plus, which the OPEC countries in the Middle East, plus, you know, Russia and uh, a couple others, they, uh, they are a big oil regime, if you will, and they decided to cut production by a million barrels a day, which that's on top of our good friend Elliot Eisenberg reminded us that um, back uh, in October, uh, OPEC already cut production by two million barrels a day, and the price of oil still came down into the, the mid to high 60s. And so OPEC plus took a sucker punch at us. I was watching at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time on uh, Bloomberg Asia, the market Asian uh, Asia markets open and talking about OPEC Plus and the price of West Texas Intermediate Crude spiking up to potentially $80 a barrel. Uh, you know, the Fed cannot control the cost of energy and it cannot control the cost of food. And those are items that still can be volatile, um, which is why they get stripped out in the core readings of, infl of inflation, core CPI, PPI, core PCE. 
you know, these things get stripped out because they're so volatile, because someone like OPEC Plus on a Sunday will decide to cut a million barrels in production a day off on top of the two million from, uh, you know, back in October on top of the BRIC countries deciding to align themselves against us. Heck, even Japan is buying oil now from Russia. I thought they were our friends. So, you know, there's some weak leadership going on here currently, and other countries are taking shots at us. Now, um, there's, you know, there's the Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve within the United States that we used a lot of, drained it down quite a bit because gas prices were getting expensive last summer. And, um, you know, we were coming up on midterm elections. There's some political strategy there in addition to getting a, a win for uh, consumers. They call it a win-win. Uh, most politicians like go for the win-win-win. But uh, we didn't replenish that strategic petroleum reserve uh, when the price of oil was around 60-something you know, dollars per barrel. Much to the dismay, as our good friends, uh, uh, the word was used uh, by Barry Habib and also another subscribe, uh, subscription I listened to, uh, which is Louis Navalier at uh, Platinum Growth Club. Um, this is payback. This is to the dismay of OPEC+. Plus. We did not buy their oil when it's cheap to replenish our strategic uh, petroleum reserve. So now they're saying, hey, you know, if you're not going to buy it, we're going to raise the prices. Now, globally, the potential to put to have more output of oil has not been increasing. I saw a CNBC clip earlier today that said, I think Guyana is like the only um, nation that's actually building infrastructure to, to bring more oil to all the markets. Um, of course, we didn't do it here at home with our pipelines. And, you know, you combine Canada and the U.S. together, and that combo is the number one producer of oil in the world. Then Russia behind them, and then Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, this kind of nationalism that was out there, this globalism after the Ukraine invasion by Russia, a lot of countries are kind of like starting to, you know, have their alliances and kind of reserve, you know, pull back and try and be a little bit more autonomous. I mean, look, we're building all these semiconductor plants here in America, um, as opposed to being so at risk of what 90% of the world's semiconductors are built in Taiwan, which is at threat by China. Think they're not going to take a shot now? I mean, are we doing anything to fight back? Anyway, so, um, Technology is deflationary, and it is a force that continues uh, to fight inflation. And I saw a very cool uh, thing called the banks, B-A-N-Q-S, blockchain, AI, nanotechnology, quantum computing, and synthetic biology. Basically all the ARC stuff, uh, ARC Invest, that Kathy Wood talks about. But technology is deflationary. Our work weeks continue to come down on average by the average hours work. Um, Elliot Eisenberg put out a pretty cool... Um, memo about that not too long ago, um, saying that our average work week has gone in 1965 to around 38.6 to most recently in 2022 to 34 hours a week. That's nationally, that's the average work week. So our workers, I guess, are less productive. We're also working less. We also have better technology to make us more productive. We shall see on Friday, we have a big uh, job support coming out this week the March jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, even though it's Good Friday and Passover and, um, you know, uh, Happy Passover and Easter is coming up for all of our religious friends and fans here. Um, and then we also have a jobs, the JOLTS report, the, the opening and labor turnover report that comes out tomorrow. So this, this, uh, in spite of all of this deflationary technology and the work weeks and, you know, the productivity of workers, we are continuing to see this battle the Fed is waging against inflation, which has been pushed up by the wage price spiral. Remember, you know, 10.4 million jobs open in America and less people and an aging workforce and people not taking those jobs, even though mostly in leisure and hospitality, um, are having the great resignation, having the effect. We have not seen a lot of job cuts. We have not seen hundreds of thousands of jobs being lost with the Fed wants to try and battle wage inflation to then crush demand. So we're watching all these factors, a lot of data points coming out this week, um, it's, uh, then it's earnings season. And so earnings season starts the second week of April typically with the banks. How do they do coming out of all the craziness from a couple weeks ago? Are they guiding down? Are they, no, they going to say something about credit tightening in the banking system, which would of course crush demand? Nobody wanted to buy houses when it's 7% rates. Nobody wants to buy cars when it's you know, whatever rates they are. Same thing with credit cards. So all these things start to come down. Commercial lending, all this other lending. So we're watching this stuff. Is the Fed going to get their way? Or 
Are we engineering a soft landing? We didn't really have a problem when 2 million barrels a day got cut back in October. Maybe the 1 million uh, barrels a day gets cut here like announced yesterday. And we weather that storm too. Don't really know. We're going to have to wait and see. Um, I am headed on vacation, going to Park City tomorrow morning for a couple days. Industry Conference 2023, but I will be working. I'll try and get you an update from there. And then it's spring break for my kids. Have a great one. Cheers. Hey, it's KP coming to you live from Park City. Get you a little sunset here. It's about 7.48, almost 8 p.m. Mountain Time. Sun just setting back there. Uh, spring break starts tomorrow for my family, so wife and four kids will be traveling up here to meet up with me. And I thought I'd give you some lovely scenery. I've been here before on some of these videos, but it's always it's always gorgeous. God, I cannot believe how much snow is on the ground in April. Um, you got to check this out. This was like a fire pit, and it's completely covered. Look at this, but it's starting to melt. So anyway, look at that. All right, enough of the. Of the beautiful scenery. Let's get to business here. Jobs report coming out tomorrow. Markets are closed. Shag Sameach for all of our friends. Happy Passover. Happy holiday. Happy Easter for those that celebrate. And hey, happy Relax Friday. The stock market's closed. Less volatility. Probably good for your heart. Uh, but the jobs report, the March Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs report comes out tomorrow on Good Friday while the market is closed. So um, the market can't really react to it. Uh, like it normally would. So Monday will be the day. But this week has been just like a little bit of just, you know, a little bit of bad news, 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 just less and less good news. And so the the fight, the transition from the fight of inflation to are we going into a slowing economy and a recession continues to dominate the headlines. Where are we? Is a soft landing even possible? Some of the bad news that came out this week, for example, was that ISM, you know, like uh, manufacturing, this is a data point that came out, it was declining for the fifth, okay, the fifth month in a row. So under 50, it's like an index. Under 50 means uh, declining. Over 50 means growing. The ISM services report, remember, services is holding up inflation right now. The jobs that are being created out there are leisure and hospitality. We know that there's still um, about 10 million jobs. Um, I think we finally under 10 million jobs at the jobs, the JOLTS report. So uh, a 1.8 million in continuing claims. We had uh, weekly jobless claims today, this morning, that were higher than anticipated. So we're starting to see cracks in the labor market. We're starting to see some cracks in, um, you know, manufacturing is declining. Growth is still there for services. The ISM services report is still above 50, but it is uh, less than last month. So slowing growth. So all these little signs keep kind of chipping away. And they always say the bond traders are the smartest ones at Wall Street. We'll look at the 10-year uh, treasury. I apologize. I just had a fireball shot. Um, uh, happy Easter. So, uh, you know, anyway, the uh, the bond traders, the 10-year treasury has been coming down. Uh, it got as low as like 2, 228, two, it's big close to that, 230, uh, excuse me, 330, 3.3%. Uh, that's the yield. Now, it's come down about 20 basis points in a week. That's a pretty big move. And again, you know, mortgage-backed securities aren't exactly tied directly to that, but rates are at a multi-month low. And so what is it going to take to kind of crack the economic data and get us even lower and get rates even lower? I don't know, but I can tell you that rates coming lower um, have really been a boost for uh, home affordability and for mortgage applications, which are up. So before I get into that, I want to um, leave one more secondary uh, piece of information. You know, mortgage-backed securities, um, you know, that's what we buy and sell. We buy and sell money in this business. Mortgages backed by the land as collateral and borrowers making their payment is an MBS, a mortgage-backed security. And the biggest buyer of them has been the Fed until they decide not to be the biggest buyer of them um, in this quantitative tightening cycle. And guess what else is flooding the market? Uh, the FDIC is taking mortgage-backed securities from both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, two major bank failures, and they have hired BlackRock Asset uh, Advisory Firm uh, to help dispose of those in an, order, in an orderly fashion. $87 billion in mortgage-backed securities from Silicon Valley Bank alone, and like another, I think, 24, 27, 34, something like that from Signature Bank. So you don't want to just dump it on the market, flood the market, because when there's more uh, supply being dumped on the market, people will... Uh, ask for a higher yield, which means rates would go up. So uh, we're not seeing that right now. Um, 
<clears throat> we're not seeing uh, it dumped, but it will have you know some impact. So it's something to keep an eye on. Okay, um, mortgage MBA uh, mortgage tech uh, it was in San Jose this weekend and uh, cool, really cool stuff. Uh, if you missed that show, the next best tech show to go to is the California Mortgage Banker Association, uh, which I uh, am on the board of directors. Um, love that group. Um, Susan Malaza is the CEO there. She's amazing. She's been there for uh, I don't know two three decades. Um, that is in Anaheim. Okay, it's right before Father's Day weekend in June, so it's at um, uh, it's in Anaheim. So that is the last good tech show uh, before we go into the fall, uh, where there's a couple tech shows next fall. So it's really your last chance to get out there. It's a good good show, and it's in Anaheim, and so it's after Memorial Day, so you can bring your family and go to Disney. So I highly advise it. Um, out of the NBA tech show last week, the best thing I heard, uh, my boy Kirk Donaldson over there at Halcyon, his income got approved by Freddie Mac to be income, approved income. It's a direct API integration with the IRS. You literally ping the IRS. No more stupid 4506 forms and faxing things in and having someone sign and wait 48 hours, 24 hours, whatever. You just ping, 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 API to the IRS. Boom, boom, boom. Data, instant. You know, it's great. So anyway, check out Halcyon. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, back to um, our business and what's going on. Um, so we have a CPI report that comes out next week. So inflation, big, big data point, okay? So the market has to digest tomorrow's jobs report, and then it'll digest the CPI, uh, the Consumer uh, Price Index, which is really important. And then earnings kick off Thursday, and the banks are going to report earnings they always typically start with the financial, the big money financial centers, right? Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase. How are they doing? You know, uh, are they worried about marking to market? What's their thoughts after all the fallout from massive bank failures? You know, the second biggest bank failure, second and third, you know, in our country's history. Are they reserving? Are they scared? Are consumers spending? Are they saving? Is the economy in a good shape? What are they seeing with credit cards, debt, car loans, student loans, money, this, that, flowing in and out, people going to cash? Are they scared? They have a lot of information, and it, the important part is what they're going to say going forward. And then the rest of Q2 earnings season kicks off. So um, it's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks. There are many, many stocks out there that may be able to weather the storm and do just fine. So um, lots of great data coming out. Uh, it's very interesting to see uh, you know, what it's going to come out um, next, uh, next week, starting next Thursday and Friday for earnings season. You've been listening to KP Talks Dollars and Cents, a top-rated show for those who want to learn about the economy and mortgage environment. Tune in each week for more episodes, and please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Kevin Perenio does not render or offer to render personalized investment or tax advice through KP Talks Dollars and Cents. The information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial, tax, investment, or legal advice. For more info, follow KP Talks Dollars and Cents on all of our social channels.